Morgan for three years. I was considering a couple different career paths, law school, MBA, and I finally decided that the best investment of my time would probably be to get a second bachelor's in chemical engineering. Uh, so I'm cur currently uh, at Ohio State. I'll graduate in May. Uh, and I have several different job offers. I've had several different co-op experiences while I was in uh, college. And I can say without a doubt that uh, engineers, specifically chemical, are very high, are in very high demand. So it's been a great opportunity for me. And uh, the reason I'm here is because I want to um, kind of share the experiences I've had and hopefully expose you guys to engineering uh, ahead of time because I didn't really have much exposure to it in high school. And had I realized it was an opportunity, I probably wouldn't have necessarily needed to get my first degree. So uh, with that in mind, here's Anne. She can talk a little bit about herself. Kind of ditto what he just said. <laughs> um, but yeah, I graduated from Independence High School um, in 1994. Um, have my uh, Bachelor of Science in Accounting and, uh, an a and an MBA from Ohio State. I've uh, been working at AEP since I graduated and, and still work for AEP. Um, I started as an accountant, um, then I went into uh, become a budget coordinator once I got my MBA, and then uh, worked in an engineering group and realized that I really like what they do. I was the budget coordinator of the folks who keep the lights on. It's called a transmission operation. So there was this huge, gigantic screen that's about twice as tall as this, uh, the ceiling, and um, it shows the whole grid at least what AEP uh, can control. And I just thought what those engineers did were, they were heroes. Because when there's a storm, when there's a lot of heat out, they make sure that we still have power. And when I saw that, I'm like, man, I'm just kind of like processing the, the financial side, but I really wanted to do the engineering side. So um, they, uh, my boss told me that I could pursue that degree. So that's what I'm doing now as a pursuing an electrical engineering degree while working too. Um, and uh, yeah, the um, I don't know what else I want to say. It, um, I did not know what engineers did until I worked in that group at AEP, which is sad. I mean, well, I, none of my family were engineers. I had no idea. Um, I thought engineers were like rocket scientists. That was as, as close as I knew, and I'm like, I can't do that. But no, nobody can until they go to school and they learn. And it's um, and always everybody would tell me engineering is so hard. It's so hard. Everything is hard. But it's doable. You just have to just get out there, get started, and do it. So um, there's that. I think a lot of the perception for engineers is that they lack written verbal skill set and. To a degree, that's somewhat true, but honestly, for me, I always excelled in written verbal. That's kind of why I gravitated to my first degree in history anyway. And I was a good math student, good science student, but it was never like my interest until I realized just the capabilities, the creative capabilities I had in engineering. And so that's kind of what uh, led me into um, pursuing the field. So just kind of a brief overview. Do you, do you guys have, think you have an idea of what engineering is? So a lot of people now, engineering, more so than I guess when I was in high school, um, people might associate it with like programming or computer engineering, um, or obviously more broadly, you have like kind of your mechanical engineers who build a car. Um, engineering in general is taking principles from science and scaling them up to a project that we can use as a, a large society. So that scaling up kind of has the term. Um, it can mean a lot of different things. It can mean going from one uh, prototype all the way up to millions and millions of products, or it can mean going from a lab scale size bench producing one or two milligrams of some highly sensitive chemical and developing that in a way that we can get super pure, highly usable products. So typically there is going to always be an economic side to engineering, unless you go and get your PhD, which then they can kind of ignore some of the economic side. But at the end of the day, there is an economic driver behind everything that we do. And that's partly mer a marriage between the hard sciences that chemists and biologists and physicists are doing and the people who are actually trying to profit off of that. And that's where kind of engineers come in. And typically, we have the skill set to be able to take the hard science 
and merge it with actual products that people use and benefit and improve their lives. So um, this is by no means an advertisement for Ohio State. Uh, having grown up in Columbus myself, I would recommend looking outside of Ohio State. Uh, that being said, all these majors, come on in. Um, so the advantage of Ohio State obviously is huge access to resources. Uh, so these are all just some of the majors available at Ohio State. So everything from astrophysics uh, to welding, uh, which is actually a really interesting major if you guys are ever uh, interested in that. And it has uh, some really good uh, career uh, options as well. There's Dr. Many, Hilo, if you're in the building, you well, please stop by the main uh, engineers office, in the Dr. Row. Hilo. You so this is just some of the myths and truth of engineering. So obviously, like, if you watch Big Bang Theory, um, questionable writing, but uh, it's the perception is that engineers are kind of boring, dorky, not creative, um, you know, like pocket calculators or whatever, and that's pretty far from the truth. Uh, you're obviously going to get people who are nerds, but I think in popular culture, nerd kind of means something different now. Um, people who are experts in, at what they do, people who dedicated hours and hours of their lives to being really good at math or science. Um, those people are actually really well-rounded people. They like good music, they yeah. kind of develops, and as the products we produce become more and more advanced, engineers are gonna be at the heart of that. And so that means that they have to be in touch with pop culture in order to make products that are wanted by more and more people. So the perceptions are often wrong, and you get a wide variety of people. Um, I wish I, it, it's our spring break, and so both of us are non-traditional students. I have a wife, and I don't get to go on spring break. But the traditional students are normal college kids. They're on spring break. They're in Florida. They're wherever. So and they have time to go out. Yeah. I know a chemical engineer at OSU who is in Las Vegas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, yeah. I think I know uh, a couple of people who are in Las Vegas. I don't know if there was like a package deal or something. But um, so that the the perception is very wrong. Um, the people in the class are all very well rounded athletes. I mean, like I'm, I myself play baseball in college, a lot of the kids played sports in high school, were in the band, just well-rounded people in general. Yes, uh, all types of people. Sorry, I didn't want to No, sorry. Um, so just some examples of what engineers make. Um, so you have like the USB drive, obviously, you can get 850 bucks, you know, and, and the scale of that, like if you think about the production, I actually have a job offer at a paper company. So 850 bucks or two thirds of a ton of paper is so resource intensive that to think of being able to scale it down to something that uses less than several ounces of material to store and, and be able to do it in a creative way that allows you to actually access those books and to be able to edit them and move them and change them around is something that's pretty phenomenal. Um, and obviously, you know, you have the typical like Apple, Fanboy, all that stuff. Um, those are great examples of what engineers do, um, but. For me, specifically, chemical engineering is where most of, I mean, obviously most of my focus is. So that's what engineers, we, we don't necessarily appreciate the creativity that engineers have, but then when, you be able to, when you're able to see those products and see them come to the marketplace and come to fruition, it's pretty, pretty interesting to see that. So um, that's just kind of some examples. They're not the best, but um, so when we get to, in your position, juniors looking for universities, Here's just some of the, the recommendations. Academic reputation doesn't really matter that much. As long as you're going to a school that provides the major that you want to study and gives you opportunities to do co-ops and internships, most schools, most employers aren't going to look at your resume and be like, oh, you went to a small school or a large school or they were number six on the list and this other candidate, his, his engineering degree is from a school that's number seven on the list. No, the only people who look at that are usually the people who work in college admissions because they want to compare each other. But it matters to some degree. I mean, it's not, you know, putting Ohio State on our resume means that most people are going to know, at least through football, where our school is. Um, so obviously the next one's going to be availability of majors. Don't go to a school trying to be an electrical engineer and they don't offer electrical engineering. Uh, unique opportunities. So. Again, I'm going to use Ohio State as the example, but please don't you know, look outside of it. Uh, Ohio State has a nuclear reactor on site. 
can actually go over there, you can see it. That's a pretty unique opportunity. There's not many schools in the country who have that. So if you're interested in nuclear engineering, I would suggest looking at a school that has access to a nuclear reactor. Well, and also with my electrical um, engineering degree, I'm taking a class right now. It's high voltage electricity. We're messing. There's like a 13 foot Tesla coil. We're like making lightning in this room. It's the funnest class I've ever had. <laughs> it's just, I totally geeked out about it because we're, um, we don't, I mean, it's more of just ob observing it and, you know, but not all schools have that. It's, you know, so, um, to piggyback off of what he said, you know, if you're, whatever you're going to study, um, look in to see what kind of resources the school has. And when you're doing a college visit, schools want to show off what they have. So I know Ohio State organizes it this way. They will do a college visit, kind of a bride, you meet with everybody, like do a tour of campus, and then they'll break you down by major. And I know the engineering department has tours just themselves. They will show off what they have. They want you to see all the cool stuff. And so if you think you're more interested in uh, biomedical or something like that, say that to the tour guide or say that to the people you're, you're talking with. They will tell you, oh, we've got this awesome lab where we're making prosthetics for you know, Iraq and Afghanistan veterans or something like that. that. They will communicate that to you. So be proactive and let them know, but you'll actually get to see some pretty interesting things while you're on campuses. Um, obviously, these are kind of the like economics of it, location and cost. Um, college is expensive. The return on investment is pretty high for engineering. They typically come out making a pretty good um, salary, but at the same time, I'm coming out looking at a, a, basically a second mortgage in student loans because I have to pay for my first degree as well. So it's something that you want to take into account. The idea for me of having to take a job because I have to pay off my student loans, it may not mean as much to you guys, but when you're starting a life and you want to have kids and, and all that, it it means a lot. And so thinking ahead, um, the advantages of being in a lot of engineering programs, you can typically co-op. So look into programs where you can maybe like pay a, as you go, work a year. Um, I know a lot of people who've taken five years to graduate, six years to graduate, and they come out with no debt. And it's an awesome opportunity to do that. Yeah, and well, just the co-ops, engineering co-ops pay well. They pay. Yeah, you're not making minimum wage or nothing like that. So you're, um, it's, it's a good deal. I know several <laughs> friends who go out for Marathon Oil. Their first year they were $25 an hour. Their second year they were $30 an hour. When I worked at Chase, I'd say that that probably would have topped people in my department were not making $30 an hour. So that's something to keep in mind. Granted, I don't necessarily want to work in oil. So it's okay. another thing to consider as well. The type of engineering you'd be doing if you think Chemical engineers typically do a lot of petroleum engineering, and that kind of gets a bad rap for a lot of reasons. So if that's not something you'd be interested in, look in other areas of engineering. Um, so what classes are you guys taking now as far as like math and science? Okay. So you guys, you guys are all pretty much on the like advanced college track and everything. Yeah, because I didn't. I, I didn't even have, um, I think I had pre-calculus in high school, I didn't even have calculus, so I was a bit behind, but I caught up. We, didn't, we only had a calcat, so we didn't have uh, AP physics or AP uh, chemistry or anything. Um, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I came in, I took the entire calculus series at Ohio State. It's gotten better since I was there. Uh, it's still one of the weaker parts of Ohio State is their math education, but then now they're actually tailoring all their calculus series directly to engineers. So you'd be taking calculus for engineers, essentially, uh, which makes it nice because it's a lot more applicable. You can kind of see, we don't, you don't do as many proofs. You do more like, okay, this is how you would actually solve a flux problem or something like that. Um, I didn't know they were doing that, that's good. Yeah, it's, it's helped, my, I caught the last end of it, and it really did help a lot, especially when I got to my upper level uh, chemical engineering classes were actually doing like mass transfer. And I've seen these equations before, the multivariable calculus, so. Um, obviously, you want to do your homework, selecting schools, get good letters of recommendation. I'm sure your counselor here and your teachers are always happy to. I've never met a teacher who doesn't want to help the kids uh, go on to the next level because it kind of makes them look good. Um, and take the time to write a well thought out essay. Uh, if there's anything that I remember from cause is that you guys typically they hounded you about writing and you wrote a ton. Uh, 
I wrote a lot in high school and it helped me a lot, especially when I got my history degree. But take the time, write a good essay, have your parents review it, have friends review it, um, have people review it, and then make the changes necessary to actually make the essay good. Administration, look, they look at that, especially if you have similar stats. You know, Ohio State is getting probably 50,000 kids a year applying. Of that, you know, 2,500 of them probably all have the same stats, we're all in the same clubs, everything. But if you can communicate who you are through an essay, they're going to be much more likely to accept you if you're on the edge. So, and this is probably a little bit more um, relevant to schools like MIT and some of the, like, the more difficult ones to get into. Um, so, if you guys want more information, obviously visit Ohio State, or as I would suggest, go outside of Ohio State, go elsewhere, visit them. Um, OSU, I know they spend a ton of time over the summer, so if you guys are on summer break, just call. I'm sure you probably need like a week or so of advance notice. You can set them up. Uh, you can go to this website, go to campusvisit.osu.edu uh, to set it up, and it makes it really easy. But I would just suggest going as many places as possible and seeing what had what opportunities you have up there. So see where where you fit. Your you know what I mean. Find where you feel comfortable. Find it's it's a big decision. So that kind of like I said, I just wanted to briefly go through the slides. Um, the opportunity, at least for me, when I was in high school, I didn't have any chance to talk to somebody who is currently getting an engineering degree. Um, I think one kid I knew from high school actually went straight out of high school uh, and got a, a mechanical degree, engineering degree. Everybody else kind of went to business or something more um, kind of generic to, to, to use the word. But um, that kid actually now works for Parker & Gamble, and he's a... Um, I don't know, like vice president and overseas, he travels to China all the time, travels to France. Um, so for me, it was it was something that I did not experience directly. Um, I didn't have the opportunity. So if you guys have any questions now, um, you can go ahead and ask them. Or yeah. So it depends on what uh, if you're in your major or not. Um, so outside of the major, like I'm in. Uh, a freshman bio class, um, you know, I, I'm graduating, just kind of, it worked out my schedule that way. There's 750 people in my class. Um, so it's a large lecture hall, but the lab itself only has 30 people. And my TA is my lab instructor, and he sends out personalized emails, he's very active. Um, but in terms of my engineering classes, uh, they've expanded the engineering major, the like chemical engineering major. So it used to be around 45, they're now around 100. And that's still really manageable. I still get access to all my professors. I have professors who've written uh, letters of recommend recommendation for my jobs and everything. So that's gonna be typical of Ohio State and probably most of your Big Ten schools. Uh, some of the smaller schools are gonna be a lot smaller. When I was at Ohio Wesleyan, uh, my class size was anywhere from like six to 20 people. So it's just kind of normal. Yeah, in the beginning, there's huge classes, but then that, your senior level classes are gonna be like 30 people, 20, 30 people. And I honestly recognize everybody in my, um, everybody who's graduating with me, I've probably had at least one class with them. Yeah, same here. Uh, chemical engineering is a little bit weird. We have the least amount of GECs in our program because we have so many, um, tech classes that we have to take. So well, every engineering major has to take biology, uh, physics, um, like the first year physics, calculus, and then the first year chemistry. Chemical engineers, we also have to take organic chemistry and physical chemistry, which is like quantum mechanics for, um, or quantum chemistry is what it's called. So you just deal with the electron. Um, so it makes our schedule a little bit less flexible. So you usually, you're on like one of two paths. You either take a class in the fall or you take it in the spring. And with people doing co-ops, you usually end up overlapping with just about everybody in my graduating class. So uh, it makes it nice, because actually those will be people I network with the rest of my life, so. How much of you or any of your friends consider doing like a PhD when I'm graduate school? I have one friend who just got accepted to MIT to do his PhD there. Um, I've got three or four other friends who are doing one friend is getting a master's at Dayton. Uh, three, three or four are still in the process. They're probably going to want to take a year off between undergrad and PhD. Um, PhD, so the advantages of 
an engineering degree is that you don't need postgrad education or uh, you don't need a master's or a PhD in order to get very gainful employment. Yeah. Um, the difference between like PhD work and undergrad, typically you go a more research-based route. So with a PhD, the earning potential um, is not that much higher, but then you're, but you're doing very different work. You're sitting, uh, I know some of the, the PhDs that are um, at, at, in chemical engineering at Ohio State are doing research on um, very specific processes to kind of do large scale production on them. Uh, one of the research projects at Ohio State that a professor is doing is trying to do clean coal gen uh, energy generation, which is Dr. Fan. Um, and so that's not something that I, with a bachelor's degree, would be doing. I would be going in being a process engineer somewhere. So I'd be troubleshooting processes, doing um, large scale or small small scale process improvements. So that'd be like budgeting capital investment. Uh, that's something that like an undergrad would do. A PhD would be, okay, how can we, what catalysts can we use to make this process 85% efficient instead of 75% efficient? So a large number of people do go in to get PhD and OSU has a very good reputation. I think we have a deal with Berkeley um, so a lot of, there's transfer, so we get a lot of Berkeley kids in, and uh, a lot of OSU kids end up at Berkeley. But that being said, they're not te the classes aren't necessarily teaching you to go in that route. But there is plenty of opportunity to do undergraduate re research, and a lot of PhDs end up using their undergrad research to go and kind of vault them on to the next level in getting their PhD. She's my lab partner, she's doing a lot of undergrad research and co-authoring papers already. Yeah. And that's, Pretty common, not just at Ohio State. At, at most schools, you, um, as long as they have a robust research and development department, research department, you'll probably get the opportunity to co-author papers, and um, that's all on you, though. Like that, that's when you get in day one, you want to make sure you contact the department that you're interested in joining and letting them know, hey, I'm interested in doing research, because your first year you'll probably just do data entry and like cleaning up and. So they trust you to actually run an experiment. So it's pretty normal though. Okay, so you said you saw other people working at Logan you were uh, how you saw other people working at Logan Engineering. Yeah. And that kind of actually interesting. What how much what what you do in class do you see in what they actually did in engineering when you were watching them? Like how much do you think they use? Um that's hard because you know I really didn't exactly understand what they were doing. Okay. Um, they were running a lot of um, programs for contingencies, um, you know, like if we take this line out, what's going to happen here and this and that. In class, we would do a lot of that. Um, if we do any of that, it, it's not using a computer program so much. So with class, what we're learning is uh, the basic fundamentals, at least where I am right now, as to how it even works. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think how else to... I guess that's it. In class, you're only going to learn the stepping stones. Of the, then when you get to your job, you're going to you're going to learn a whole other set of skills. But you'll have all of that knowledge to um, to help make sense of it. Do you know what I mean? So you'll learn. I don't know if I'm being very clear, but you learn the fundamentals and then you apply them in your job. Because every job is going to be different as to what software they use or or that. But um, you'll at least be able to understand what's going on. Like me, yeah, I didn't understand what was, what was happening as a budget coordinator. I just thought it was cool as all get out. Um, but uh, now I'm kind of understanding what they're doing. Pretty much every company I've spoken to is in my different interview processes, they anticipate having to teach you their process, essentially. Um, what makes an engineering education so valuable is that it, you learn a problem-solving approach. You're given a, a, a very strong tool set, a very powerful tool set to solve a, a wide variety of problems. So, you know, I had a background in physics, chemistry, biology. I, I could go into most situations and with maybe about a month of research on my own, I could probably get up and running on a project. But most companies that hire you fully anticipate having to teach you their specific process or their um, software package or however they're managing it. Um, and that's why the engineering education is so valuable. They don't 
some of what you do in class is directly applicable. Um, so some of our more in chemical engineering, some of the more kind of tangible ones are like kinetics. We actually do reactor design. So you you know, design, okay, how long should a, um, a specific chemical species be in a reactor? Like what, what sort of uh, reaction rate are you expecting? Is that exothermic or endothermic? Does that mean you have to add heat to the process or remove heat? Those are things that chemical engineers who are doing that type of engineering, so working with a, a, a reactor, those are things that they're doing in real life. They're typically using complex software packages. We do everything in MATLAB, um, which is actually a really interesting programming language, a uh, really interesting environment. Um, learning that, so that's the only programming language I have, but it's, a, it's called an upper level programming language because it has built in functionality. So essentially, like, there's functions that have already been signed and they already have codes of all their own, and all I have to do is type that word in and I get that script to execute. Um, but the advantage of that is it, the programming language itself is kind of, the syntax isn't really important. You can learn syntax or whatever, wherever. It's we learn how to structure it, how do you build a for loop. Uh, so those are things that you'll learn in undergrad, and then when you go somewhere, you'll become more of a specialist, and they'll teach you more specifics about um, their process and how they run it and what their expectations are. And that's, that's industry-wide. I mean, everybody expects it's probably gonna take you six months once you get out of school to learn and to get up and functioning. And typically it's gonna be, they usually say about 18 months before they can actually give you a project of your own and expect you to be able to do it. And even jumping off of that, it's uh, with I think just any engineering degree now. Uh, so I have a background in accounting, finance, MBA. My job title right now is a uh, senior financial analyst. Most, um, uh, most companies now want engineers to do financial analyst job because engineers have already proven that they can and they have a very analytical brain and well that, that they're smart and that is something about um, that's something about engineering school that I got was uh, some self-confidence in myself that I didn't have before which is kind of a weird byproduct of just going to become an engineer um, you'll find that when you, there's a certain um, level of respect you get just from saying you're an engineer versus um, something else. Um, but yeah, I think Disney, I think GE, I think a lot of these big companies hire engineers to do their financial um, analysis now. So I mean, you might even get an electrical engineering degree and then go work um, analyzing financials and helping management make decisions uh, just because you you've had all that problem solving drilled in and you know your numbers. So, um, I mean, talk about not even going to school for what you're gonna end up doing, but that's that's who they're recruiting as engineers for that. Yeah, there's a ton of opportunities. I'm actually interviewing for a analyst, risk analyst position at Chase. So, and they hire a lot of engineering background people. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's, it's definitely out there, uh, you know, you're gonna be, I think there's advantages to a liberal arts education, uh, having one myself, um, that maybe the engineering misses. Um, so I, I, a friend of mine is double is getting a, a minor in English, um, and it makes them a little bit more well-rounded. Um, so one of the traps that a lot of engineers fall into is that they want to solve every problem like it's an engineering problem, and that's something that I think a lot of people kind of miss out on, like the social side of it. And, you know, how do you communicate the problem? How do you even understand the problem in the first place? And so I think that's something that schools are trying to address. I know OSU is doing, um, working on a program to incorporate more writing, not just technical writing, but more kind of creative writing. Um, so that would also be something that you guys would want to look at when you look into schools are what, how specific is the curriculum and what are you guys exposed to outside of it? Because I think one of the shortfalls of engineering is that sort of like, it's very, very powerful tool, but it's not the only tool in people's tool belt. So that's true. Um, so we were talking about creative uh, writing. So you ever have any, any personal projects you guys work on? Because like one of the things I looked up was uh, you guys constantly have like, this stage of burnout. You're, like you're just exhausted from like math and science all the time. Um, were you, are you saying specifically like kids who are an undergrad or like engineers five, ten years into their career path? Mm -hmm. Just like. Okay, so 
in school, I would say yes, you get burned out. Uh, I got burned out specifically last um, last winter. I had a the hardest. I had thermodynamics, um, fluid and or, uh, heat and mass transfer, kinetics, and uh, I followed that up with our unit ops lab, which was a four week super like twelve hours a day, five days, six days a week. Um, so. Come June, I was pretty burned out. Um, and then I ended up taking summer school and everything. It is something that I, I think that going in, you should know that. Uh, it's going to be hard. There's gonna be, usually it, it peaks around your second semester of your junior year. It gets better after that. My senior year, the classes are not nearly as technically focused. They're much more kind of economics. The math isn't as hard. It's more kind of understanding where you fit in the world going out and it's kind of to prepare you to be an engineer. Um, the other class I'm taking right now is a design project. And so the design project links us up with local businesses and has, a, has us actually work directly on one of their design projects. I hit a jackpot, my design project is with Jenny's Ice Cream. So I go to Jenny's Ice Cream once a week, I get a free pint, I look at the process, I look at the freezing process, and at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the semester, so right around May, I'm gonna give them a report, kind of telling them, hey, here's some things I think you guys can improve. They have one specific problem that we're working on, um, and it's awesome. Some people, they ended up with like Honda, and it's a much more technical, difficult problem. So to supplement that, I would say, the design project is definitely that, that opportunity, but you don't get much say in it. So if you, would, if you wanted to do other things, I would, look, I would recommend doing the research and that gives you more exposure that once you kind of get into that research side, you can kind of fan out and professors will push you to more, to different professors they think you might be better suited for. Um, that being said, my boss, when I worked at Entra Tech, which is a films and adhesive company headquartered out of here in Columbus, uh, he started his own microbrewery in his house with three of his roommates. Um, so his other two roommates were chemical engineers and the last one was an electrical engineer. So they built this entire process just like, that has like control, he controls it from his laptop, and like it does everything. So there's a culture around it, there's people who are interested in it, but sometimes you have to facilitate it yourself. Yeah, and about burnout, again, every every major is hard, and I would say that that, that second semester of your junior, junior year is hard for, for all students. So, it was when I got my history degree too. It was the same. Yeah, and I remember there was a class I was taking differential equations, which is I was having meltdowns, I think, once or twice a week. Well <laughs> I'm like it's kind of embarrassing, but I'll admit it. And but I got through it. And now I'm in my senior level courses and they're more tailored. They're it's more because those junior level courses are like your pillars of of the of the major yeah. and they're so broad that they're they're so technical at the same time your senior level it, it's a little bit scaled down you're, you're learning higher level stuff but it's uh it's more simplified or not simplified it's more um applicable, yeah, applicable. so it's fine-tuned which makes it a little bit more easier for your brain to to digest and, and get through it and um yeah, just know that if, if you think it's hard, which you will, and but know everything's hard and you can do it. You will do it. And you, you're gonna have to pump yourself up. Like, you know, um, you'll, you'll be fine. And we, we've all gone through it. Um, the advantage too is that at the end of the day, if you don't wanna be an engineer, most places will hire you just because of your engineering background. You know, I mean, if you wanted to go work for a, a, a lot of different variety of places, Essentially what your engineering degree says is that you know how to take really complex technical problems and digest them, break them down into components that you can manage to, to solve, and then build those back up to a, a, a complete solution. And that's useful in any area of business, any any project you ever want to do. That's something that you can, that's a skill set you can use the rest of your life. And that's something that I think is, makes it popular uh, for employers because it's so specific in, in the way that it does that. Whereas it's it's difficult for me to articulate on, on a resume or an interview how my history degree helps me. My history degree really does help me in a lot of ways. And it, it helps me kind of 
view problems in a variety of different ways and understand different perspectives, but it's really hard to put on a resume, it's really hard to talk about in an interview. So if you have the opportunity to get those education, I would 100% recommend it, and that's kind of maybe one of my criticisms of like the current U.S. education system is that we don't, you know, we focus on one very specific thing. But that being said, if you already think that you have the proclivity towards engineering, math, science, the gratification that you'll get being in that is will overweigh the the burnout, and it's something that you, you come to learn to manage the rest of your life. You know, you're gonna. If you think you're going to get burned out doing something, then you probably are. I mean, it's just the kind of the way that human people tend to work. So it's something to, to consider, but I, you know, I think there's a lot of different ways to circumvent it. I think there's, you know, a lot of a lot of my friends are active. They do whether it's like um, they go on trips, they go, they do like rock climbing. So that to me is more maybe like a, a life management thing than necessarily because you know, like fine arts majors. They burn out. They spend you know 12 hours a day in the art studio, and they get burned out too. So, so like going off of that, um, I know you guys both have like different degrees, like two different degrees that are a lot different. Um, you know anybody here? Do you know how like viable it is to do like a double major in something that's really different, like say music and engineering? Uh, um, you wouldn't be the first. Uh, I, I know that for a fact. Um, it's not. It doesn't happen that often, but if you do it, I would recommend setting yourself up to take five or six years for school. Right. Yeah. But if you if you're prepared to do that, then it's it's definitely doable. It's definitely manageable. Every school would be happy to do it, happy to accommodate you. You're just gonna have times where they overlap. Um, I know, like I said, I have a friend who's doing uh, English, and he actually was double majored, but he wanted to finish school uh, on time, so he just did a minor in English and uh, did his. Uh, <coughs> His main degrees in chemical engineering, so it's definitely out there. It's definitely a possibility, um, and if it's something that you're interested in going in the door, I would make it well known to the university. I would make sure that when you're scheduling your freshman year, you're scheduling so that you can pursue both paths because you get, you'll get to a point where essentially your schedule you don't you don't have any flexibility. You have to take this class, and it's only offered at one time. So as long as you've prepared for that down the line, it's it's definitely doable. Yeah, and some majors require certain GECs. Well, like like um, engineering required physics as my chosen um, science, and accounting I could I I was able to choose whatever science I wanted. So I took plant biology my first time through. Coming back, I had to retake. Um, well, I had to take physics because my science um, credits didn't transfer over. They're just like a bunch of empty credits. So yeah, if you're gonna do it from the onset, you know, if you think you're going to do it, start planning ahead, you know, as you start scheduling your classes. But I will say with having my business and my engineering, even at ADP, I'm getting job offers now, and I don't even graduate till next year. I'm getting um, managers very interested in the, the duality of that. So, um, so there's definitely an upside. Um, kind of along with that, like liberal arts and um, engineering. Do you know anyone who's done a three two program? I know he's at Oberlin and I love him. A lot of schools offer that, but seems like there's not much information about that. So I had one friend when I was at Ohio Wesleyan who actually did a three two program with Rose Holman, I think. Um, so he's now a what's that? Technical school. Uh, it's a technical school in Indiana. Um, he is now an engineer at Honda. Uh, I kind of lost touch with him. I, I think we're friends on Facebook. He's the only friend I know. I, OSU doesn't do it just because they're so robust that they don't really. But some of the smaller schools, and that's definitely something that I would encourage you to look for, and especially you know if that's something that you think you'd be interested in. I know Ohio Wesleyan was very rigorous academically, so it prepared him, uh, this kid Joe specifically, very well for the technical side. Because the the rigors of the liberal arts are still just as rigorous. You know, they still expect you to spend hours doing your homework, and sometimes it's a little bit more nebulous, so it makes it even a little bit more difficult. Um, whereas the technical, it's like, you here's a problem, like here's the tool set, how to how to solve it. So I would definitely recommend that. Oh, okay. yeah. 
because um, and along with that, I know that there are two, that like Swarthmore offers a general engineering degree. I know I've heard that like, specifically if you want to go into engineering, that having a general degree isn't as useful, but would it be useful for what you're talking about, like how places will hire you because of the skills that it comes in? I would recommend, just in my experience, you took a, a focus just because you're probably going to end up doing the same amount of work. I mean, there's the only advantage I could see is if you were kind of interested in a little bit of electrical, a little bit of mechanical, but we actually get a, a fairly decent amount. There is a fairly decent amount of overlap in, in the majors anyway. So I would recommend avoiding the general engineering just because it, it would be a little bit harder to quantify in a, in a, on a resume or in a job interview. Um, which isn't to say anything of, I'm sure the education is out, outstanding. I'm sure that the skill set that you're learning and everything is probably the same that we would be learning. But the lack of just, you know, just putting engineering tends to kind of make it difficult to market that. I meant more because, yeah, for the liberal arts part of it too, having that. If yeah. you wanted a way to combine that, but then you would be giving that to specialty. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that it would actually save you that much classwork. So I, I think. It, and I don't know any specific general engineering program, so it might be a little bit different, but I know like the mechanical engineering degree at Ohio State, for instance, is like they have about three less classes than we do in chemical engineering. So I don't know that you'd actually be saving yourself any time that you could be spending on a liberal arts degree, you know what I mean? Like you'd probably still have the same number of classes that you'd have to take. Um, and it wouldn't necessarily, then you would kind of lose the leg up uh, so to speak, of like a specialization. And there are um, you, there are some courses you do get to choose. You know, it's not all laid out for you. Um, those free electives, uh, I don't know, you get about a semester's worth, maybe two semesters worth of things you can just take that to enhance your own experience. So um, I think I'm kind of within. The, even though I'm kind of using mine in a more general sense, having it be electrical engineering will help me personally more than if it was just a general. And a lot of places do hire in more general senses. Like the job offer I have at the paper company, um, I'd be doing kind of process engineering if they hire mechanical and electrical and um, industrial engineers interchangeably with chemical. So that's, that's the only reason I would say you have maybe a better chance. Now, Swarthmore is a very good school, so just having that on your resume would probably be pretty, pretty significant. But um, I would, I, in my experience, I'd recommend the focus. I haven't seen anybody, I haven't come across anybody in my co-op experience or in the working university who has just a general, edu general engineering. Like your schedule, because you have a white mom, it's kind of busy at times like the job. Um, so I've worked on and off throughout my time, but I, I've had the advantage of not being full time while I'm in school. So my freshman year, so I, I worked at Chase up until I started school at Ohio State. Um, Class-wise, I took under quarters, I took three classes a quarter. Under semesters, I took four classes a semester. Um, so I, I went the entire year, and I took summer classes. I took organic chemistry over the summer, and then I went through the end of the fall. So I was in school about 15 months. I then co-opted full time for Unilever, and then when I got back into town, I worked for Entrotech. I worked with them for nine months, and then I finished the fall term of my sophomore year. Uh, I had the advantage of taking some of some of my classes counting towards my GECs. GECs are like your liberal arts, your social sciences, and stuff. So it saved me about a half a semester, or about a semester. I mean. So after that, I finished, um, I worked while I finished that uh, one fall semester. So I took two classes, and I worked 35 hours a week. Uh, I then took, went, quit my job, went back full time, and I've been full time since December of last year. So I'll, I've spent about 18 months again full time. And full time for me is four classes. Um, that is actually a lot of time. I, I spend probably on average from about 8.30 to 5.30 or 6 on campus, um, which makes it difficult for having a, a relationship and everything outside of school. Um, if your partner is in school, it's not really as difficult. But, um, so it's, it's been manageable. Um, Anne's probably had a little bit more experience with managing both than I have. But. Yeah, well, one, it's taking me six years to get the second degree, and that's even 
um, with some of my business degree helping with about a semester or so worth of, well, all those empty credits that I get to apply to the engineering um, degree. So, um, and since AEP supports me in this endeavor, they, they let me take time out of work to go to class. Um, I'm full time there, but then I have a laptop. I work from home a lot. I mean, it's still AEP takes priority. So um, I usually take two classes a semester because that's about all I can handle. And even then, I'm not an A student because I can't be. I, um, again, work pays my bills. So <laughs> um, school, is, and they support school, but work comes first. If I don't have work, I don't have school. So, um, and I have three kids too. So being able to work from home helps because then I can still be home um, and get what I need to get done and, um, and do the best I can on my homework. Again, I don't, I am not your A student, I'm your B and C student at this point, um, sometimes D. But I am gonna graduate. And you know what, at the end of the day, I will have an electrical engineering degree. And um, yeah. Similar to the old adage, like you know, what do they call the, the guy who graduated with the lowest grade from his medical class? They call him a doctor. So, yeah. it, having it on your, I know my boss at my uh, first job was had a graduated with a, a two A in chemical engineering and never went without a job. Never had a question. He he also worked through it, so it took him six years. It, it I had three and a half years with basically coming in the door and it's taken me four. So. I think at the end of the day, I've known a lot of great engineers that weren't 4.0 um, students anyways. I mean, when you take a co-op or whatever, that means more on your resume than your GPA. So, because um, that shows that you, one, can work in, an, in that kind of environment. Um, so. Ohio State hosts is a, host a uh, career fair every year with like 250 employers. Um, usually, you'll have trouble if you go in there your first year. So they, I'd say once you kind of work, on, focus on school all the way through your first year. So they do a fall and a, and a spring one. They do hire a lot from that fall one your sophomore year. But most schools do that. Uh, I know even some schools, some of the smaller schools around here, sometimes push kids to Ohio State. So I think we allow people there. Um, but Almost every school has a career fair or like has access to like a larger career fair. Um, now with um, uh, what's the uh, child site that everybody puts their resume on? Now? I can't remember. Uh, I have a job, so I don't use it. Yeah. <laughs> what's that? Yeah, LinkedIn. Now with LinkedIn, oh, like I get thank you. <laughs> I get offers on LinkedIn. I get people talk to me on LinkedIn. Uh, Glassdoor, I mean, these are all there, and they will hire you, um, or oftentimes, if there's a company you're interested.